So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to be here today and to introduce the class um, for October the 1st in Technology and the Future of Medicine. Um, I'm pitch hinting today because Kim is uh, far away, I think still in Nepal, and obviously enjoying himself much more than we are here. So, um, what I would like to do now is to say a few words about our speaker. Uh, Ross is what I would call a early convert to this class. And uh, he's an early convert because he was uh, one of the founding students who was very interested in what we were doing in this class and has been uh, an avid supporter of it. Um, Ross is, uh, an under, took his undergraduate degree here at the University of Alberta. So you see, today you'll get a good grasp of the kind of people that we turn out. And um, I'm sure you'll be interested in um, how he presents this material. The other th thing I'd like to say is that Ross is a, in a PhD program. He's a candidate in physics. Uh, most of his work has been in uh, condensed matter physics which, of course, um, is uh, deeply related to nanotechnology. And um, I asked Ross what he hoped to do in the future, and Ross is uh, pretty interested in applying uh, what he's learned here in the business world. So, in other words, he wants to take the information he garners at the university, and he wants to take his doctorate, and he wants to move into uh, business applications of uh, nanotechnology and uh, especially those things related to medicine. So, without further ado, may I introduce to you uh, Ross Lockwood. Yeah! <laughs> Thank you, Earl. That was excellent and uh, accurate. So, I arrived by a skateboard, which was a, an item that I had put on my to-do list at uh, one of the earlier lectures when Kim said that uh, no one has yet to arrive by skateboard. So now I can check that off my to-do list. And I uh, guess I'll quit this. All right. So I've got a little bit of housekeeping before we go right into the lecture. Uh, for everybody that was interested in the 23andMe account, I've got good news and I've got um, good news. The good news is that they have agreed to do the academic program with me, but not in the way that I thought. So rather than sending codes to you individually, everybody that gave me an email address, they've asked me instead for everybody to create a 23andMe account. And without data, this account basically is a test account, so you can go in and you can play around with the parameters that they have there uh, with uh, a sample set of data. Uh, but once you have an account, I'm going to have to recollect your email addresses and usernames that you use to register with 23andMe. And the good news is that the price that they're offering, if we do it in a particular way, will be less than what I estimated the $80 to be. So uh, from what I understand, if we do a bulk order for everybody in the class that's interested in the package, it'll be a $60 shipping fee uh, for the initial kit and $33 for each additional kit. So that's almost half the price that we estimated initially, and over half the price uh, of the full-priced kit. So without further ado, I am going to begin the lecture. So just a quick question. Who has heard of Richard Feynman before? OK, so about half of you. That's, that's good. That means that a lot of this will be new to everybody. Uh, Richard Feynman is a very famous scientist, was a very famous scientist. And he's known for a lot of notable accomplishments in his lifetime. And one of them was giving a, a lecture entitled There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom in 1959, which is considered the groundwork for the nanotechnology revolution that exploded in the mid-'80s and early-'90s. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the historical context that Feynman uh, gave this lecture in and what's happened since that lecture was given. So, Richard Feynman was born May 11th, 1918, in far Rockaway, New York. Uh, his parents speculated that if they were giving birth to a boy, that he would become a scientist. And indeed, he did a Nobel Prize-winning scientist. So that was a little bit of uh, maybe 
premonition on their point, part. Uh, he attended the Massachusetts Institute for Technology and received his bachelor's degree in 1939. And as you all know, this is uh, just prior to the Americans' entry in the war. And his contribution to the war effort was to go and work on the Manhattan Project and the atomic bomb. Uh, he's here pictured with Stanislaw Ulam and John von Neumann, uh, kind of figureheads in computation. So from a very young age, Feynman was, uh, was an academic and was in academic circles all along. His role in the Manhattan Project, uh, he reported to Hans Bethe and uh, worked with Niels Bohr and Robert Oppenheimer as well, but he was the, the lead of the computation group at the Manhattan Project. And this is really prior to mechanical computers. And what it consisted of was that he was the lead of a group of humans who had minute tasks of doing hand computations. So they had a group where they would pass cards to one another uh, and each person would be responsible for a calculation and then pass them on to the next. And he had a lot of really interesting thoughts about this type of computation. And in fact, uh, there's a really interesting anecdote that he details in one of his bio autobiographies where uh, they had some trouble about the decks of cards being mixed as they were being uh, dealt around. And uh, the way that they solved that was uh, quite clever. He claims that he is the only human to have witnessed the atomic bomb test with a naked eye. And this would be the Trinity test, which is marked by this uh, monolith here. The Trinity test, uh, when it was done, the, the, the authorities handed out these special sunglasses to protect people from the intense light of the, the atomic blast. And Feynman, being a physicist, knew that if he sat behind the windshield of a truck, that the UV rays, the ones that are particularly damaging to his eye, would be absorbed by the glass. And so he didn't wear the uh, protective sunglasses that were handed out, and instead he was able to, to capture the raw visible photons from the first atomic blast without uh, apparently any damage to his own eye. Uh, after the war, he was invited to the Institute for Advanced Study where Einstein, Godel, and von Neumann were working at the time, but he turned it down to follow Beta to Cornell and later uh, moved to Caltech where he did his no work in uh, quantum electrodynamics. And he won the prize there in 1965. So the, the image that you see on the right-hand side of the screen there is uh, the, the ball, the Nobel Prize ball. And uh, in typical Richard Feynman fashion, he's got an interesting face. Uh, later in life, in fact, very late in life, uh, Feynman was invited to participate in the commission investigating the Challenger explosion uh, in 1986. And it was quite fortuitous that he was on it because uh, he had a very honest opinion about what went wrong. And uh, what he thought, what he knew went wrong is that uh, one of the O-rings on the solid rocket boosters became brittle at the very low temperatures that this shuttle was launched at. In fact, the shuttle was launched at a temperature that engineers recommended it wasn't launched at because they had not tested uh, for this type of failure in that type of weather. And Basically, Feynman lambasted the NASA administration for under-assessing the risk posed for the launch at this, and he has a, an incredible quote. For a successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. Talking about, of course, uh, that they should have done it at a, a higher temperature. There are a lot of great anecdotes about Feynman. This is basically the undergraduate physicist's Bible of Feynman. It's called Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. Uh, but he's also authored many books that are still used as textbooks. So when I took my graduate quantum mechanics course, I was taught out of uh, a textbook called Quantum Mechanics and Path Integrals, which at the time was available uh, in original hardbound copy on Amazon for over $1,000. So we made do with one copy among the entire class. Uh, but that's just how good that, uh, that textbook is. So, in 1959, Feynman gave his famous lecture, considered the conceptual beginnings of the nanotechnology revolution. And in this lecture, he promulgated the idea that manipulating individual atoms uh, 
by manipulating individual atoms, you could basically build machines at a very small scale and store information at a very small scale. And, uh, and he came up with the idea of actually doing chemical synthesis by mechanical manipulation. So instead of uh, mixing, mixing flasks of, uh, of liquids like chemists do, uh, sometimes with a bit of magical overtones, he figured that you could probably just click atoms together if you had the appropriate tools to do it. And he basically detailed what those tools might be. So just to give you an idea of what was happening uh, around that time, the first commercial transmission electron microscope was introduced in 1939. It used electrons instead of photons to magnify the image uh, of a sample that you wish to look at. And uh, that magnification was on the order of about 100,000, where optical microscopes could only do about 2,000 times magnification. Uh, of course, in 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik. In 1958, NASA was formed. And uh, on the solid state side of things, the first germanium transistor was demonstrated in 1947, and the first silicon transistor demonstrated in 1954. And in the same year that this talk was given, Texas Instruments commercialized the first integrated electronic circuit. So the things that Feynman talked about in this lecture had not really yet existed. Uh, in the way that he described them. So he had a lot of foresight about, uh, about these things. And I'm going to read a quote. It's quite long, so uh, you can listen rather than read. But this is straight out of the, the lecture that he gave in 1959. As soon as I mention this, people tell me about miniaturization and how far it's progressed today. They tell me about electric motors that are the size of the nail on your small finger. And there is a device on the market, they tell me, by which you can write the Lord's Prayer on the head of a pin. But that's nothing. That's the most primitive, halting step in the direction I intend to discuss. It's staggeringly, it is a staggeringly small world that is below. And in the year 2000, when they look back at this age, they will wonder why it, is, uh, why it was not until the year 1960 that anybody began seriously to move in this direction. And uh, he was quite right about that. Uh, I don't wonder why people didn't start until 1960 to do this, but I think that this is a, a pretty good indication of uh, the kick in the pants that the scientific community needed to start moving in that direction. So now I'm going to show you a clip from a lecture that Feynman gave in 1984 at a, at a meeting called Idiosyncratic Thinking. And this lecture basically is Feynman uh, talking about uh, his, his lecture in 1959. So let me see if I can do this without too much trouble. Return to the, the, uh, the lecture here again. So now we've seen that. Uh, so what's interesting in the lecture in 1984 is that when he gave it, he gave an example of a computer chip that was three millimeters on a side and had features that were 20,000 times reduced. Uh, today, we can do far better than that. But before we get to the discussion on that thing, I'll just continue here. So there's another great. Um, quote from his original lecture that I'll just throw up here. I've estimated how many letters there are in the encyclopedia, and I've assumed that each of my 24 million books is as big as the, an encyclopedia volume. And I've calculated then how many bits of information there are. For each bit, I allow 100 atoms. And it turns out that all of the information that man has carefully accumulated in all the books in the world can be written in this form in a cube of material 1 to 100th of an inch wide, which is the barest piece of dust that can be made out by the human eye. So there is plenty of room at the bottom. Don't tell me about microfilm. And what's interesting is that uh, this is a great calculation, but it really doesn't represent the current num amount of information that exists. So I looked up a, an estimate of how much knowledge exists. And uh, I found a couple of numbers. Interestingly enough, in 1985, it was estimated that there was 2 and a half exabytes worth of data globally. And as of 2011, that number has inflated to 285 exabytes globally. And this is uh, you know, something that I was reading about, and they said it was optimally compressed. So what that probably means is that if you had you know, a very efficient way of compressing a YouTube video down to just its essential data, you would still end up with 285 exabytes worth of data. So I did this calculation again myself, and I came up with uh, some some other numbers. If you wrote it on a 2D silicon surface using a binary encoding scheme on each subsequent silicon atom, you could fit that 200, and, actually it was 295 exabytes worth of data 
on uh, an area about 25 meters square. So that is about the size of this room. All the information of humanity would fit if you had it uh, written atom by atom. If you could somehow do multiple layers of the silicon atoms, so after writing one layer, you start on another one, and you build a 3D structure, kind of the way that he describes this uh, uh, piece of dust, you would end up with a cube about seven centimeters on a side. So what's interesting is that all of the information of humanity, if you could somehow encode it in this way, would still fit inside of your head. You would have a volume less than your brain volume. At the end of his talk, he gave two really interesting challenges to the audience. And in fact, he posed these as high school challenges. The first was to create a motor that was 1 64th of an inch on a side. OK, that's less than half of a millimeter on a side. And the second was to write a page of text 1 125 thousandth of an inch smaller in linear scale. And um, he admits that he didn't think this through, because in 1960, uh, William McClellan demonstrated a motor that was exactly 1 64th of an inch on a side. And uh, in his letter to McClellan, Feynman laments that uh, the challenge was maybe a bit too easy because McClellan didn't use any new machining techniques to make this. He used conventional machining techniques and a lot of dexterity. So he assembled this using toothpicks and, uh, and just standard tools. Nothing new was invented to create it. But the second challenge took another 25 years before it was achieved. And a graduate student at Stanford named Tom, uh, Tom Newman uh, did it by writing the first page of Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities using an electron lithography technique. So this is the year after Feynman gave the lecture that I just showed. And uh, what's funny is that in that lecture he said, it's still not possible to do this. So, each time that he posed the first challenge, it took a year to do. And the second time that he gave a lecture on the same topic, it took uh, a little less than a year to achieve again. So this really is kind of the, uh, the fundamental turning point in the, in the nanotechnology revolu uh, revolution, where we're really starting to be able to do things on a very, very tiny scale. So the next thing that I'm going to talk to you about uh, diverges a little bit from nanotechnology just for a minute, but it was something that Feynman did later in life, and it was something interesting that I thought you would, you would think is interesting too. It has to do with the t-shirt that I'm wearing right now, and the t-shirt that Feynman was wearing um, at one of these other lectures. And in 1983, there was a graduate student at MIT named Danny Hillis, who came up with the idea of building a massively parallel computer called the Connection Machine. And he envisioned a computer with one million processors, each connected to one another with a line of communication. And luckily enough, at the time, Feynman's son Carl was attending MIT. And he got involved with this project as an undergraduate student helping Hillis on, on this project. And as a result, Feynman got involved because he was also uh, interested in, in it as well. And what ended up happening is that Hillis founded a company called Thinking Machines. And they decided to build these new architectures in the Connection Machine 1 and the Connection Machine 2. Only instead of a million processors, they would start out with 65,536, which is 2 to the 16 processors. Uh, they would be one-bit processors that could all simultaneously perform their own calculations. But the trick was that they needed to communicate with one another. And this had never really been done at that scale. So they started off with 16 processors on a single board, on a single chip. And they needed to connect each of these boards to all the other boards. So they needed uh, 4,096 chips. And they needed to come up with a way to connect all these processors. So Feynman was actually put on the job of designing the router that would would uh, tell the computer how to communicate between processors. And what they did is they settled on a 12-dimensional architecture uh, so that each, each processing chip would be connected to 12 others. So I'll just go quickly through what I mean by 12-dimensional architecture. Uh, a zero-dimensional object is a point. A one-dimensional object is a line that joins two points. If you take two of these lines and join their edges, you get a square in two dimensions. And if you take two of these squares 
and join their edges, you get a cube in three dimensions. If you guys know what a four-dimensional hypercube looks like, you know that you take two of these three-dimensional cubes and you join all their corners together. There's two ways to represent this. So you can have a cube within a cube with all the corners connected by these diagonal lines. Or you could take them apart, just pull one cube outside of the other one and, and draw these fancy lines. And that's, in fact, what they did at the Thinking Machines company. And they made an abstraction called a hyperline. So from now on, when we connect two of these cubes together with one thick line like that, it represents all the edges connected together. And remember, while we go through this, that this is the actual architecture of the connecting connection machine one. So each of the corners of that cube is connected to each of the corners or the corresponding corner of the next cube. So how do you go from 4D, which is this uh, basically line-like structure? Well, you take two of those, and you connect them together. And there's your 5D structure. Six dimensions is taking two of those structures and joining them together. So now we've got a cube of cubes, which represents the six-dimensional architecture. The next big jump is to go from 60 to 90. And the way you do that is by taking each corner of a cube and inserting one of these 60 cubes and joining them together with hyperlines. So now you've got a nine-dimensional cube. And finally, to get all the processors in, you take uh, one of these 90 cubes and put it on each corner of a cube to form this 12D hypercube architecture. So that's actually how the machine was connected up. Now imagine that, of course, there's 16 processors on a chip, so there's a lot of lines of communication between chips, and uh, you, you have this massive machine. Uh, Hillis himself drew the, the diagram here as this 12D architecture, and he represented the software as this fuzzy, uh, loopy structure that goes around it, just kind of illustrating that when software is running on this machine, it's a distributed software set. And the final product, the CM1 and the CM2, had a very unique industrial design that had these little LEDs on the front that would light up when one processor was talking to another one or, or computing a, um, a little bit of information. So this got into the popular culture. Uh, it was showcased in Apple's Think Different campaign in 1998, but Feynman also wore this shirt in a computer heuristics lecture that he gave at that same symposium. So I really recommend that you guys watch that lecture. It's quite easy to find. Uh, and it describes, the t-shirt the itself describes the 12D architecture of the CMO. I've seen this image for a long, long time, and I've always wondered what it was. And in fact, before I even decided to give the lecture, I had looked it up, and I was like, oh, that's really interesting. I wish I could talk about that um, once or twice. So in use, the connection machine was actually a very incredib incredibly powerful machine. Um, while Feynman was helping them with the architecture of it and designing the routers, he also, he also showed by hand that the connection machine would be much faster than machines that were being built at Caltech for doing simulations uh, called quantum chromodynamics. And in fact, the type of program that, that ran on this type of machine is one that is basically um, cellular automata. So if you guys have ever heard of Conway's Game of Life, that was the first program that ran on the connection machine. And the reason why the computer is so good at calculating these is that each processor only needs to look at the nearest neighbors. So I don't have a, a little video of Conway's Game of Life, but you can imagine it's basically a checker, checkerboard style um, 2D space, and that each nearest neighbor looks at all the other ones to decide whether it lives or dies in the next time sequence. And you get this really beautiful evolution of structures. No question? OK. You guys can stop me if you do. Um, Stephen Wolfram also demonstrated a program which would calculate turbulent fluid flows. So this is another example of one of these programs that is a nearest neighbor interaction program. You really only need to know what the fluid is doing in the neighboring cell to be able to calculate what you should do in the next time step. And everything updates uh, each time step. So Stephen Wolfram went on to create Mathematica, and he's got a book out for a number of years now called A New Kind of Science that deals a lot with the type of problems that can be solved with this type of machine. But uh, one of the things that you'll be interested in is that all of you have seen the Connection Machine 5, the predecessor to the CM1 and CM2, and CM3 and CM4. It's called Frostburg, but it was featured in a movie uh, called Jurassic Park. 
And I don't know if you can see it with the lighting here, but it's just behind Dennis Nedry's head. And he, in fact, mentions it by name uh, in a quote. You know anybody who can network eight connection machines and debug two million lines of code for what I bid for this job? Because he can. I'd like to see him try. So uh, the work that Feynman did in the, in the 80s uh, is, is still in popular culture today. So let's go back to the topic uh, that we started on. There's still plenty of room at the bottom. In this slide, or in the, in the image on the left, uh, this is taken straight out of the lecture that Feynman gave. He, this was a computer chip that, uh, that he showed. And just for comparison, I put up the new Samsung A7 chip, which is in the new iPhone 5Ss. And uh, you know, besides the technique for imaging them, they look, they look fairly similar. What's interesting here is that uh, Feynman said that the, the features there were reduced by about a factor of, of 20,000 to make that computer chip. On the right-hand side, the Samsung has developed a 28 nanometer process. So the smallest features in Samsung's chip are about 20 na nanometers. And it's, they use a process called a high K metal gate process. I don't know the details of how that works, but uh, we can do quite a bit better than what Feynman talked about in 1984. So just to give you an idea, imagine that all the features on this, uh, on this old chip fit into one of these tiny squares at the top of this new chip. And that's about the right scale of thinking there. So now I'm going to switch pace again. I'm going to uh, show you a video clip from a researcher here at the National Institute for Nanotechnology named Bob Wolko. This clip is quite a bit shorter, but it talks about exactly what Feynman was describing. And this was given in 2011. So I'll just click through that right now, and we can watch that. All right, so it was a little difficult to see, but does everybody understand what was happening there? Starting with a particular silicon surface that has hydrogen atoms capping each silicon atom, they were able to go in with uh, one of these scanning tunneling microscopes, which basically is a, a, a single atom sharpness tip. And they could apply enough electric field and, and actually remove one hydrogen atom at will at their control. So this is the kind of control that Feynman was talking about not being possible in 1984. And what's really interesting is that in that original talk, he said, we can't mark atoms. And while that's true, the dangling bond, when you actually remove a hydrogen, the dangling bond is an electron orbital that sticks out waiting for a chemical reaction to happen. That would be considered one way of marking an atom. But again, Feynman said that we have to manipulate atoms. So you know, creating this mark means that you have to remove a hydrogen atom. So let me jump back to the lecture here. Uh, so, oh. And go back just as so later on in the same video, Wolko goes on to say, with our human hands through the scanning tunneling microscope, we are not only manipulating atoms, we are manipulating electrons. So that's a stark difference from what Feynman was saying was possible only uh, a little over 20 years after he said it, 25 years. So again, we're seeing these things where not only can we now manipulate individual atoms, but they even showed us a demonstration of how you could do a controlled chemical reaction. That styrene molecule, when it binds to the surface, wants to grab the next hydrogen atom and pull it off, creating a dangling bond, which can then be reacted with another styrene molecule, which will pull the next hydrogen atom off, and so on and so forth, until you've got a nice line of these styrene molecules. Well, what's the use in that? What if I wanted to draw a styrene wire? What if I wanted to create components with particular direction and orientation on the surface? Now we're discovering that we can actually do these things. But the next videos that I'm going to show you are even more impressive because they don't require molecules whatsoever. They're actually using those hydrogen dangling bonds, the absence of hydrogen capping on that surface, as the functional component of it. And this is something that Bob Wolko's group is calling atom scale electronics. So I'll just show you this first clip here. And it's a very cool uh, animation, so everybody should enjoy it. So that's one of the, the projects that the Wolko group is working on. And uh, I've got one more clip to show you that uh, they used to actually make these things. 
So we're on the silicon surface. We've got an STM tip, but we need that tip to be precisely one atom at the top. And Wolko's group has actually come up with a technique uh, to do this. So I'll just stick it in there. And this one's not narrated, so I'll talk over it. Uh, well, so this is actually, um, it's called an electron field microscope. Oh, why is it that? Here we go. So this is an electron field microscope. And we're actually looking at the emission from the tip as the tip is changing. So what's happening is that there's a very high field on the tip. And electrons are streaming off the surface onto a phosphor screen, which gives you these nice uh, bright spots. And what they do is they leak in nitrogen gas. And that gas climbs up to the tip and grabs an atom and tears it off. And what they can do by applying different ratios of the field and different uh, concentrations of nitrogen atoms is they can actually eat away at the tip. And they can see which atoms are still present. And they can adjust the field strength and the nitrogen content as needed until you go from millions of atoms down to a few dozen here and eventually just one single atom tip. So you've got this very nice tip. So then this tip can go in, and it can be the one that pulls those hydrogens off. So where are we in terms of what we can do with a technology like that? Uh, and I'll just point out that in two weeks' time, when Michael Woodside gives his second lecture, he'll be talking about this process in a little bit more detail. But these are the kind of things that you can do it, uh, that you can do with it. And so in the top left there, there's something called a single electron transistor. Of course, this isn't yet a working device. It's a demonstration of the principle by the, one of Bob Wolko's graduate students, Marco Tauser. But you can actually see uh, an image of a, a device, a line of electrons, a single electron in the center there, and then a gating uh, line of electrons as well. And uh, I'll just zoom in on this one to make it easier to see. In A there, you can see one of these uh, four electron sites and a row of them, that would be one of these quantum wire configurations in the cellular automata um, video that I showed earlier. But then you can use those and actually make gates. So in B, you can see a matrix multiplier. In C, you can see a full adder. So you've basically got inputs where the state of the lines would change, and a corresponding output would give you an answer based on what your inputs were. It's not quite easy to see here, but you can see there's a lot of disorder in these images. And that's one of the current limitations of it, is that uh, the technology today isn't good enough to make a completely robust device using these methods. But as you can see, we're getting very, very close. Um, some other examples of devices that we all use today that are based on uh, the, these new techniques, like electron beam lithography, here is a uh, an iPhone 4's gyroscope, which was uh, uh, found by the iFixit and Chipworks team. Um, and there's other things that we can do today. So you've uh, all heard of quantum computers. Uh, what you may not know is that there are current commercial quantum computers that are on the market. A Canadian company called D-Wave has a quantum computer, which some people say is not a true quantum computer but does operate using something called the adiabatic quantum computing theory. And uh, a lot of people think that this is actually a, a very useful device. NASA, Google, and USRA have bought a, a D-Wave 2 system for their quantum artificial intelligence laboratory. Lockheed Martin has a 512 qubit system from the same company. So these devices uh, are in their infancy right now. They're room-sized. but. So were computers in 1959 and uh, the 1960s when Feynman gave him his talk. So the commonality of all the things that we've discussed so far is that they're all, all being done in two dimensions. Um, now, you could argue that there is some three-dimensionality to current chips because they're based on a layering process, right? You put a pattern down and then a pattern on top of that for interconnects and a pattern on top of that for devices and, and things like this. Uh, but a true 3D architecture would be many of these layers, not just one functional layer. You'd have two or three functional layers. And there are problems with this, the heat and uh, associated problems with that. But uh, there's progress being made in those, in those areas, too. In 2004, Intel produced a version of its Pentium 4 chip that was based on a 3D architecture. 
And this year, Samsung has a new product called the VNAN solid state drive that has a 24 layer structure. So this is one of the ways that we can, uh, as you can see, double the number of transistors per unit area. The trouble being that we have to get much better at cooling these things if they get larger and larger. So what are the future possibilities? Well, we talked a little bit earlier about if you could have a true 3D uh, method of storage, you'd be able to uh, accumulate all of humanity's knowledge into a small cube. There's research uh, underway on something called the Diamond NV Center. This is a diamond nitrogen vacancy center. And what it is, it's a diamond structure. So you've got a face center cubic array. This is the standard diamond configuration with each uh, carbon atom bound to its four nearest neighbors. And what happens when you dope it with nitrogen is that uh, one of these carbon atoms can't bind in that in that spot, so you get what's called a vacancy. And there's a, a lot of really interesting things that you can do with these vacancies. The vacancies are electron orbitals just like uh, the, on the silicon surface. Here, uh, you can play with the spin of the electron, but these are also luminescent centers, so you can fire a laser at them and read out their state based on what color they are. The trouble is, again, that you have to have minute control over where these are, and if you've got a bulk diamond, you, you don't know, you know, if you're firing uh, an accelerated ion beam of nitrogen ions into the, into the structure, you don't know exactly where you're hitting them. So to really make a true computer from this type of uh, structure, you'd have to assemble a diamond layer by layer, putting in the components that you wanted at each site. And that still requires what Feynman was talking about, is molecular control of of that, so actually being able to click a new carbon into place, which would require a lot of energy to, to do. But one of the possibilities for future computers. So I'll just end on a, a slide that I've got uh, listed here is computronium, really the future of computers. And computronium is a theoretical arrangement of matter that is the most op optimal possible form of computing device for that amount of matter. So this would be, let's say, if you could have one of these diamond computers where every second carbon atom was one of these computing components and they were all tied together in a logical way. But the question there is what kind of things would you compute with that? What would you ask the computer for? And I put up a picture of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy deep thought there um, to kind of give you that idea. Because their computronium does exist, but not in the way that it's described here. If you wanted to calculate the levels in a helium atom, how would you do it? Would you ask a computer to do that, or would you ask a helium atom? And the answer is that you would ask the helium atom. So in a sense, atoms themselves are a form of computronium, but they compute themselves. They tell you what the properties of their own state is. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank you guys very much and invite you to um, have a little brief discussion. Thank you. So flipping back to the start of your lecture, sure. what was the solution for the cards? For keeping Say them that again? The cards that they were using? Oh, that's right. That's actually detailed in, in, uh, in this book. Uh, I think I have a copy at home, but if not, I, I'll be able to pull it out. Basically, what Feynman deduced is that uh, they were trying to parallelize their computations so that you weren't simply taking one card off a stack at a time and passing it on to the next person. And what he found is that you could actually shuffle decks together and get them out of order and run them through. And you know, each individual calculation only involves one card. But that by mixing up the cards, which was initially thought to be a problem, you could actually still run through the computation. Um, you'd just have to figure out a way of demixing them at the very end. So um, I haven't actually read that in a couple of years. But there are some interesting thoughts on, on how he, I mean, remember, he was very young in this age. He was in his 20s when he worked in Los Alamos on the Manhattan Project. So, these are very clever solutions for their time. Yeah. 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 Um, I was wondering, what, could you go a little more into what a quantum dot was from that example? Sure. Um, of course, next week when uh, Dr. Woodside comes in, he'll be talking about that in detail. But I'll just show you, let's see, I'll pick one of these slides. Was it, what, was it like the table that the electrons were around? Or was yeah, that okay, just well, like let's the use nucleus? this one, sure. So a quantum dot is basically, it, it can be many things. There are different types of quantum dots. But basically what they are are they're ways of representing data that is 
um, not the classical sense of a 0 or a 1, but uh, a superposition of both states. And so to do a calculation on a quantum system, you basically set the, the system up into a quantum superposition, and then you pose the question, and the quantum state will collapse into the answer. It's actually very strange, and it's actually outside of my ability to explain it. But it can be used in problems like uh, encryption, where you're looking for the decryption key for something. So you set up all these quantum dots in a particular state, and then you say, here's, here's uh, the question that I want to know. And basically how they work is that all of the answers are somehow encoded in, the, in these quantum states. But the answer is the one that you measure when you finally uh, collapse the wave function of these quantum states. So that's about as good as I can do today, but you'll hear more about it next week. OK, thank you. Any, anyone else uh, want to uh, ask a question? I mean, we have a whole uh, 20 minutes yet. I fulfilled my end of the deal, one hour. You guys have to fill the rest. So for the computer on your shirt there. Sure. Has the University of Alberta started building anything similar to it? Uh, there are massively parallel computers these days. So, so the University of Alberta is part of a, a number of consortiums. Uh, you may have heard of Westgrid, which is a supercomputing consortium. So um, students who have access to Westgrid basically write their little programs, and then they get terminal access to this supercomputer, which is, uh, I think, it's actually spread across Canada. I think there's sites in Vancouver and Ontario for Westgrid. Uh, but the connection machine isn't the most efficient way to do parallel processing. And uh, I, actually, I shouldn't say that in particular. Um, there are other ways of doing parallel processing that don't involve having the chips communicate to one another. But it is a big problem having the chips communicate uh, between each other. So this was a really good stab at this parallel processing problem, uh, there's, there's better systems out there these days. And you know, the best supercomputers in the world are working on the exact same simulations as I told you, the Stephen Wolfram turbulent fluid flow. Um, you know, the supercomputers in Japan that they use to, to model the uh, weather on a global scale use a similar, are, are doing a, a very similar thing. They're doing nearest neighbor um, simulations and uh, the computer is working on each individual spot all at once in parallel. Uh, unless there's somebody else. So using the, the computational system by, of the diamond, can you then take that into like a fluid state and start as the, the pieces that you're looking for, beaming your nitrogen molecule really as your at? Oh, this, this structure is really confined to the solid state. If you had any, any fluidity here, you would lose that, that vacancy. So this vacancy, the reason that it sticks around is because the diamond lattice is very stable. And as soon as you lose that stability you know, by heating it up, if you guys don't know, you can quite easily burn diamonds. So, uh, so you, can, you can break these things. But, uh, the operational parameters for a computer based on this principle would probably require it to stay in the solid state. Now, while we're on the topic of that, that type of computer, there, are, um, there have been computers demonstrated based on DNA that do computations in, in the liquid state, but I don't know very much about those. Hello. Oh, OK, it's on. Uh... I was wondering uh, what sort of, okay, th there's a lot of stuff in this lecture that's pretty awesome to me and I don't understand all of it, but I kind of want to see like um, where are things moving because I, I can understand that, you know, you keep building things smaller and smaller, you can fit more, there's more storage and you have more computational power, but in terms of like real, I guess, applications, do you see anything in the near future? Uh, oh, sure. I mean. Uh a lot of this stuff is manifest in the kind of devices that we're using today. Um, we all have um, nice laptops, maybe smartphones and that kind of a thing. The thing that I think will really change in the next five to 10 years is that our power consumption is going to plummet. 
that we're going to be able to do. So one of the really cool things about these, um, uh, these quantum cellular automata structures is that the amount of energy you need to send a signal is vanishingly small compared to our current technology. Like, even in our phones today, the actual processor is passing current. So electrons are actually moving through those things. And if you notice from the, uh, the earlier movie that we watched, oh, where'd it go? This guy. Those electrons only move in the chairs around the table. They don't move from table to table. So if you are able to build something like this in a commercial device, you're reducing your power consumption. You know, the energy that it takes for one electron to go the length of that wire, that's how much power you're saving because the electron only has to switch seats. And that signal propagates down as all the other electrons switch seats. So um, you know, we are getting more and more um, nanomechanical devices. So like the gyroscopes that we've got in our phones now, those are getting smaller and smaller too. So um, there's one really interesting device that is actually uh, being developed at the National Institute for Technology, but it's an atomic um, uh, mass spectrometer. So you know, uh, if, you, if you could tell, let's say, let's, we sample the air and we run it through a mass spectrometer, it could tell you what fraction is oxygen, um, what fraction is molecular oxygen. You can basically distinguish between um, what different things are in a, in a given sample. Uh, think of it as a sense of smell. And one of the things that they're doing is they're developing these torsional oscillators. So there are, yeah, these mechanical oscillators. There's little fingers, like nano beams, and they have a resonant frequency that you could couple light to. So you could run a fiber optic by, and you could have it vibrating, and the optics then give you the readout of what the state is. But if a molecule falls under the surface of that, it changes its resonant frequency. And you can tell exactly how much it changes by reading the light that passes by it. And if it was, you know, if it was something with appreciable weight, like an alcohol molecule, you'd be able to tell right away, OK, an al alcohol molecule has fallen onto this. So not only would our phones be able to tell you know, what the magnetic field direction is, you know, what the orientation of the phone is using the gyroscope, but it would be able to smell our environment. And this is something that we talked a little bit about last year in our, um, uh, in our business uh, exploration. One of the products that we did was a distributed network where your phones communicate with one another and with centralized services that tell you, OK, a whole bunch of phones in this area are detecting natural gas. And they're all centered around this one particular location. So rather than waiting for a human to dial 911, why don't we just dispatch uh, a hazard control team? Uh, and this is one of the things you'll probably learn about in uh, some of the computing lectures, that the Internet of Things is going to be a big change as well. So on the nanotechnology side of things, there's a lot of other sensors that we can make. Uh, my own PhD is using a silicon quantum dot, which is um, a collection of silicon atoms that are about 10, 10 nanometers and smaller across. And I'm able to, I, I can demonstrate that uh, I can detect alcohol which is why I use the example. Uh, but I've also demonstrated that I can detect some types of explosive tracer gases, too, if they can oxidize the surface of my quantum dot. If you want to see really quickly, I'll just pull down um, my Dropbox folder here and pull out some, uh, some of my figures. So I've got PL pulse curves. Pull this over. So these are, this is, uh, this is a map of my quantum dot's color and intensity. So you can see that uh, at zero time, the quantum dots are basically in an off state. And as a function of time, so from, from zero to 60 minutes, they actually get brighter and they shift their peak wavelength. But I've got these curves down here, which uh, will take a little bit of explaining. We've got time at the bottom, and then rather than Intensity, we've got integrated intensity. So instead of showing you a spectrum, I'm showing you the total brightness of the quantum dots as a function of time. And each of these curves is a different, uh, is a different experiment. So the blue is uh, oxygen carrying a saturated ethanol vapor uh, into the sample chamber where the quantum dots are. And they get bright as a function of time. That's this nice sloping curve. And eventually, they saturate. But if you have, you know, here I'm pulsing it in. Uh, every five minutes for two minutes, so I get the zigzag pattern. And in this one, I'm pulsing it in every, every five minutes for 30 seconds, so I get a different pattern. So in industrial processing, you could immediately see exactly how much ethanol you have in, in a carrier gas, and you'd be able to tell 
if it was within the parameters of that industrial process. Um, I also demonstrated that uh, in an inert gas, the ethanol does something different. So you actually need both the ethanol and the oxygen to produce this, um, this zigzag curve. And this is just the same, the same experiments, the same colors, corresponding colors, only rather than showing you the, the integrated intensity of one of those curves, I'm showing you where the peak is. So you can actually measure the brightness of the quantum dots, or you can measure their peak intensity. And you can see that these oscillate with the same period as the ones up here. So you could actually you could tell what's on the surface just based on what color they are. Now, there's some trouble with mine, of course, because they're not selective, right? I can't tell the difference between a water molecule. Well, I shouldn't say that. I can't easily tell the difference between a water molecule and an ethanol molecule. And they are fundamentally different, because there's the two carbons on the ethanol, and there's no carbons in water. Um, but they work by basically the same principle. So if it was in an industrial process where there was ethanol and water mixing, I would have more trouble. But I've actually demonstrated in the case where you do get mixing that I get a nice, uh, I, I, I am able to tell the difference between percentages of them. So uh, there's work to be done, but this is essentially what my PhD is creating a little um, nano sensor based on a silicon quantum dot. That's pretty uh, incredible stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's fun stuff. Other uh, queries or questions? I don't want to get too, too much into the, uh, um, the application side. I think that's about as far as I want to go there, because next week uh, on Tuesday, Dr. Woodside's lecture called The Promise and Perils of Nanotechnology will go into these topics in incredible detail. And, you know, I'm actually disappointed because some of the things he does for his work don't go into his lecture, just like the things that I do in my work didn't really go into the lecture. Um, but he's got this really incredible method of using optical tweezers, which is a laser beam that has a focal point that holds a little bead. So he can control precisely the positions of these beads in, in three-dimensional space. In fact, in liquid is where he does it. Um, but he attaches proteins and DNA onto these beads, and he can actually, you know, he can pull apart a DNA, or more interestingly, he can pull apart a protein and he knows exactly how much force is necessary to, to pull it apart. So you, I don't know, you guys have ever played with those little magnetic beads? Uh, they've been called um, what, quantum dots, is that right? Or magnetic dots or whatever? Anyway, they're these little ball bearing sized neodymium magnets. And they, you can, you know, you can pull them into lines and you can collapse them into different structures. Well, amino acids work in a similar way of course, amino acids can distinguish um, between other amino acids and how they conform to each other. So when you're assembling something like a protein out of a chain of amino acids, the way it clicks together is important for the structure of it. And things like, uh, uh, what's the disease of the brain that uh, bovine, yeah, pre prions, prions. Um, those are malformed proteins. So he, he can pull those apart and see how they what force is necessary and see like at what point does this protein go wrong and uh, I think I think he'll talk about that but if he doesn't I will have a, a stick to shake at him because that's really like the kind of things we can do now we are manipulating atoms we are manipulating molecules and this is something that is fundamentally different than 50 years ago when uh, we thought we could but we didn't know how now we know how and and now we're getting started like now is when you start to see these things come into, into the marketplace. And I'm not talking about, you know, silver nano-coated socks that kill bacteria. I'm talking about actual, like, functional machines that are working on the micro and the nano scale. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I just have short questions. Uh, could you move to the, win uh, the window back to this window? Oh, another one. The My, video. Yeah. Uh, the video. The video. Okay, sure. Looking at the wrong. Yeah, this one. Sure. So, uh, so this video is you remove the nit uh, nitrogen items or you compact them? Yeah, they're actually flying off. So it, maybe it would be easier for me to do this on the board. But um, we're looking. If you imagine that the STM is a is a finger like this. 
we're looking down at it. So this is looking down at a single atom on the tip. If, uh, if I play this again, what happens is if it's like there's many, many fingers, right? And I'm looking down at them. And the nitrogens will come in on the side and they'll creep up to the top, chemically react with an atom there in the very high field. And when they chemically react, they'll follow the electric field line and get blown away. So they actually come and they, they hit the phosphor screen, right? And they get pulled out into the vacuum. So eventually, you, once you pull off all the atoms, you're left with a single atom at the tip. And that's where the field strength is highest, right? So the shape of the, the needle, like this is the really cool thing about it, is that the shape of the needle means that only atoms nearest to the tip are pulled off. Right? So you could accidentally pull off this one, but then underneath that, there's five more supporting it. Uh, so you actually get a thinning from the sides inward to a single point. And the interesting thing about this, obviously, is that this is the world record for the world's sharpest object. This is a Guinness World Record, but it's unbeatable. That You can't make something sharper than this. This is the sharpest thing that you can actually make. Use that, you can use that to remove any items? Well, it depends, right? If when we're talking about the silicon surface, you go in with a tip like this, and you apply a field, and it pulls the hydrogen out, right? And then you can move and pull another one out and pull another one out. And I showed you some of Marco's uh, you know, preliminary designs trying to draw these structures. But they've actually made their own font. And it's smaller than uh, the, the, the slide that I showed you back in 1985. It's one of the actually smallest forms of writing that you can do. You can't do much smaller than removing hydrogens from a silicon surface. So there are some very interesting implications of that. Um, so Ross, um, a couple of questions. Can the, um, can the atom bend? Can In other at words, yes. The atom itself. Yes. Um, that's, that's interesting that you phrase it like that. Uh, when we think of an atom, you have to think of the structure of the atom. So yes, there's the right. proton at the center, and then there's electron orbitals around them. So in a sense, if you can consider the entire system with the bound electronic states, you can change what those states are. So the ones that are being imaged on uh, the silicon surface here, uh, let's just go to this bigger slide. These little arrays of four, um, you, you've changed the shape of the atom in height, right? This is, uh, it's called the highest unoccupied, or sorry, highest, highest occupied molecular orbital. And that's what you're actually seeing in the white there. So it's an electron that's actually jutting out of the surface now because it's got no hydrogen to cap it inside, to, to smoosh it back in. Um, and when you apply an electric field, it's not that you're bending these states, but you're actually switching how long the electron spends on one side of that four-sided structure than the other. So you can actually get, uh, you know, when they had that big group of electrons in the animation, you actually, you're pushing the electron probability distribution function. So it's fundamentally different than using the word bending, but in a sense, that's exactly what it is, is that you're bending where the electron is and pushing it around. So you can sort of control the shape of what the atom is. Um, is the uh, speed of the electron uh, predictable in, in all occasions, or does it change depending upon um, cool. situations? And uh, yeah, That's a really and, good question. Uh, when we're talking about electrons in, in molecules like this, they're typically in stationary states. So from the quantum mechanics point of view, we know where they are we don't know how fast they're going, right? This is the fundamental limit of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It, uh, you can tell where they are, but you can't tell how fast they're going. Um, you could conceivably uh, do some calculations on the average speed of the electrons in those states, and you could tell how fast they're moving, but it's not, uh, it's only half of the story to think about it in terms of classical quantities like that. So I, I, can't, I can't really answer your question, because uh, at that scale, the question doesn't really make much sense. <laughs> okay. OK, so uh, the, the last question I have is heat. Um, you know, electrons moving like that generate heat. And um, 
at the quantum level, how can you control that heat? That uh, seems to be a problem with me. Right. And there's actually, that's a very interesting problem. So in Feynman's original talk, which I, you guys should at least read the transcript of, um, he talks about making little combustion engines. And he actually concludes that you can't because you could never get a piston if you're, let's say you wanted to combust a single gasoline molecule. If you had a piston and it was compressing this, it would, the, the heat that's needed for the, the gasoline atom to react would actually dissipate very quickly out of the structure. So there's, there's the, the problem with heat dissipation on the atomic scale is that heat manifests as a lattice vibration. And the term that we use to describe it is called a phonon. So if you imagine that you've got, let's say, just a diamond crystal structure, and you're heating it up, uh, it's, there's these things called pseudoparticles of phonons that they're, they're quanta of vibration that propagate through this thing. So you know, if you've got a skipping rope and you, and you do a big swing like that, and you get a wave that propagates down to the end of it, that's you know, maybe a classical analogy of what a phonon is. You can send these phonons down there. Uh, so basically, as you're heating things up, they get more and more unstructured. Uh, and the problem is that if you're creating these devices with many, many layers, the heat has to escape outside of it. So one of the ways that um, some companies are tackling this are actually by creating these little micro channels inside of the circuit that they can flow a liquid through that's cooled. Uh, obviously, there's some bad things that can happen if the liquid interacts with the chip itself. But that's you know, one of the fundamental challenges that we are trying to overcome. Um, there's materials like graphene that are really good at, at letting phonons out, that letting them spread away. So you could maybe layer graphene down and then heat sink it off of the chip somewhere far away so that the, the graphene itself soaks up the heat and lets it propagate away very quickly. Um, uh, and then obviously one of the things you can do is do it at a very low temperature. But the trouble with that is that, you know, uh, am I going to be carrying around a phone that's cooled to absolute or close to absolute zero uh, just in my pocket? <laughs> and that seems like a, a really large technological challenge. My query is based on uh, an application in surgery, obviously, where you might be able to use that heat as a tool in, in uh, surgery and other kinds of. Uh, applications like that. And so I just wondered if at the quantum level we could control that heat enough to use it as a tool. Yeah, and you know, we're kind of getting outside of my own research area, but uh, it's conceivable that there are types of materials that have not yet been discovered that are really good at this or could somehow make heat only flow one way through them, like a heat diode. Um, now, of course, at, this is way beyond, I think, the scope of, of science as it is right now. And that idea is probably in the realm of the crackpot. But you know, I, I don't know, honestly. There may be people that, are, in fact, are working on these one-way, like, heat pipes. Uh, so things are very strange down at those scales. And you know, when you talk about high-temperature superconductors that weren't discovered until very recently, you know, superconductors, superconducting ceramics are very, very strange materials that allow electrons to flow through them with zero resistance. And you know, right now, the highest temperature superconductor, well, let, I'll just say that high temperature superconductors operate at liquid nitrogen temperatures, which is not far away from room temperature, not as far away from room temperature as, uh, hold on, let me look this up before I get it wrong. So. I-T-C superconductors. Let's get the temperature right. Yeah, so 138 Kelvin is pretty cold. Pretty cold. Not, not a naturally occurring cold temperature, but not far off, right? Mm -hmm. We're at 138K, and we've got 135 degrees yet to go to get to zero Celsius. And there are places on Earth where we get down to minus 60. So 
you know, the day that someone discovers a minus 60 superconductor, the Arctic will be colonized. That's There'll be great. servers up there immediately, right, running, running these devices based on these. Well, Ross, I have to say on behalf of everybody how much we've enjoyed your presentation today. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.